And thank you very much for coming. Um, it's, uh, it's a great honor to meet you all. And uh, as Carsten said, I've been spending, actually this year it's 30 years in trying to figure out how do we avoid making too many errors. Um, I have had the opportunity to work on some extremely large scale projects. So we've been able to do real science to figure out how do people learn? What actually leads to performance? De dealing initially primarily with physicians, some of you have probably tried SimMan or SimBaby or other kinds of simulators. So a lot of those patient simulators are run by the software from my first company that I sold to Leado about 20 years ago, a little bit more than that. I've worked a lot in trying to understand how cogn cognition and skills are interacting, something that suddenly became hot again in the last few years, because for a period of time we thought that they were two different worlds. And I had a theory all the way through that knowing something about what you're trying to learn actually sped up the learning, and it does. So, but before we do that, I, I want to um, prove that the original title, which is actually from last year, where unfortunately I got sick the same morning, um, it's not just clickbait or the lecture version of clickbait, just talking about AI to get people to show up. I promise we will talk a lot about AI, but a little bit like the NVIDIA chips. Have anybody heard about NVIDIA? Raise your hand if you heard about NVIDIA. So NVIDIA is the chip that allows OpenAI to build large language models. But the chips themselves are not as sexy as what we can do with them, right? Like for us at least, unless you're an engineer, it's not as interesting to know exactly how the chip works. So what we're going to do today is, for the, for the next foreseeable uh, time, we're going to talk about what is it we're trying to accomplish. A lot of this we've tried to accomplish for 20, 25 years. It's not been possible until recently uh, to do it at scale. That's why the understanding, what is it that the goal could be that we could then accomplish now with use of large language models, particularly. We've used AI for many, many years. A lot of the things I'm going to show you are domain-specific versions of AI. It's just not what you read about in the press called ChatGPT or GPT-4 or Gemini or something like that. That's a whole species of new models. There are tons of other kinds of AI out there as well. But instead of starting with AI as the focus, let's start with what we want to accomplish. But we'll make a short detour just for a little bit of time. Anybody remember what hereditary hemochromatosis is? Raise your hand. Ooh. That's the thing where you, where you like, cannot get rid of the iron in your body. So you, you have to like, uh, give blood. And if you don't do that, you get liver problems when you get older. You get diabetes or things like that. Anybody has a training course, taking a training course in hereditary hemochromatosis lately? I just picked that because that's an area of particular interest for me, but I've never done it before using these technologies. And how do we now switch here? We do that by maybe doing this. Here we go. So this is a really, really boring, unsexy technology on the surface of it. But this is something that, as we're talking about a lot of other things, we'll build a course on hereditary hemochromatosis a course that in the old days would have cost between fifty and hundred thousand dollars to make, and it's on an R and D server, so it, there is a risk that it uh, it will break. I built it earlier today. I haven't looked at it, but I built it so that I was sure I had something in case the internet didn't work. But we're trying to do it live, and the only thing we have done so far to set it up is I've given it a name, and then I've given it an audience, which is a four-hour course for medical residents. That's it. The rest is basically a super technology that lives on top of a large language model. In this case, we use GPT-4. Have you ever all heard about GPT-4? Who, who, who have not heard about GPT-4? Not heard about GPT-4. That's good. Everybody have heard about it. So we'll come back to how it works and why it works. But this is uh, probably the first time you see something that works this way. This is groundbreaking, even outside medicine. This is a breakthrough in how you, get, how you put a planning technology on top of a large language model. It happens to be extremely valuable in medicine and in, in education in general. The largest projects we worked on, we had five and a half thousand authors doing the kind of work uh, that we're going to now ask this technology called MindFlow to do. It's ex it, it does look extremely boring. There's nothing sexy about it. There's no flying things or things turning or anything. But over time, you will see what happens. So the only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start what we call a mind bot. That's a robot that can build content for us together with with uh, GBT4. So in some ways, it uses GBT4 the same way as OpenAI uses NVIDIA chips to do what they do, but the goal is something else. Here, we're using GBT4 just as a cruncher of language to do what we really want from an 
edu medical education perspective, an editorial perspective. So we pack the super technology with everything we know about what makes good education. And hopefully there will be a course that comes out of it at the end. And the only thing we're going to do is just to say, start from scratch. We're not even going to tell it what the scope is for it, except that it's a course for medical residents, residents four hours, hereditary hemochromatosis. We want e-books. We want learning objectives. We want probes, which is questions or other ways to check for it. And we wanted to make like interactive slideshows that are all narrated at the end. That's it. Now we started. And then we'll come back to it later. This is a little bit like a television kitchen, except for the fact I'm not going to interact with it. We can check once, a, once in a while. Probably we won't check on it until the first part is over. And then we go back to talking about what is it we're trying to accomplish. So how many people have fallen down that step in, over the years? I've fallen twice now. Um, so I'm writing a book. I'm just finishing up a book with one of the leading experts in the world on the problems in education. And during COVID, Tony Wagner is his name. He um, is in his mid-70s, retired, he thought. Because during COVID, he made a dangerous move. He said, how can I help? I said, write another book. I'm tired about writing books about the problems. Write a book about the solutions, the good examples of learning, mastery learning that works. Meaning, mastery learning is the stuff that you can use for something. Like the stuff where you didn't learn it for get a grade on an exam, you didn't learn it to get a badge or something, you learned it so that you could do something with it, you could solve a problem, something that is important for you, for your patients, for your family, for your employer, for your society, doesn't matter, but just something where you can use what you learned for something. Sports is a good example. Like all, most of sports is mastery learning. It's not, you don't have to be the best in the world, but you need to master that backhand or you need to master that in order to be able to use it, right? But what is interesting about getting to that, most of us who went through traditional education did not go through a system that worked that way. And one of the most fundamental things we, we uh, disregarded was a famous Churchill quote, you most likely know this one, that he is always ready to learn, but he's not always like to, he didn't always like to be taught. Really interesting, how often are we being taught? We're actually doing it right now. This is violating the most fundamental principle about how adults learn. Like putting a lot of people into a room like this and then having somebody saying this can only be used for one kind of, of learning, which is when you get a first introduction for something. Hopefully, I can't promise anything, but hopefully from a charismatic speaker who's able to add something more than just the facts. The bad news, I'm on the board of the number one technical university in Europe, and I often get into trouble when I warn the professors that you probably won't be lecturing 10 years from now. Like this is hopefully going to go away. And I think I joined the board because some years ago I was called in as, a, as, a, a, as an expert to, to speak to them, as giving them a keynote. And I said, I, at the end of it actually, one of the board members concluded, we probably shouldn't build more auditoriums. No, I agree with that. So I'm, I apologize for the format and I apologize for violating this principle, but take this as a fireworks ride through what is possible. So mastery is, again, not about what you have learned. It's about what you can do with what you've learned. And then there is the last part that is super important in the future, which is it's also your ability to learn even more. And that's a, that's a new trend. It's been snug, like sneaking up on us over the last like 10, 20 years. But before that, a very large part of our society went to school, got a degree, got a job and did the same for the rest of their lives, if they were lucky enough not to get fired on the way. But that was a really normal model. That model is likely to change dramatically in the future, also in medicine. The interesting thing is, for other reasons we started working on this, because building simulators back in the 90s, what we realized, and we, were, we primarily thought that these were human factor issues like communication, uh, critical thinking, collaboration on, on, uh, on teams, that kind of stuff, the fine stuff, the sophisticated stuff, because we, we've all went through medical school and nursing school, so that was okay, right? But it wasn't. There were different kinds of problems, and a lot of the human errors we were seeing when we started people putting them under pressure in simulators was that their fundamental knowledge models were so weak that they were actually not useful when you got them into a critical situation. In practical terms, what happened was, that your cognitive overload just peaked in the middle of trying to solve something hard because your fundamental learning had not worked well enough. 
That means that if you study other, other uh, groups, and I've had the luxury for 25 years now, 30 years almost, to study high performance, high reliability teams of different kinds. And just two years ago, almost three now, three years ago, I found a pocket of performance that is extraordinary. I've never seen it before. I'll come back to it. Cave divers. Cave divers are the most extreme training nerds and, and safety nerds you'll find. They're doing the most dangerous things in the world, well, some of the most dangerous things in the world. But because they do that, because they die themselves, they behave like the pilots in the early days. They're doing everything they can to improve the training. They are, they are like sponges for better training methods. And they're really, really methodical and impressive. We can learn a lot from them. We'll come back to it. So the nice thing is we've actually been able to find some solutions to this. And I'll come back to what they are. Um, we built a, like a pretty significant amount. We built st products been used in between 50 and 100 million learners. But more interesting for you guys is that more than 3 million healthcare professionals are being certified uh, in uh, acute procedures using these methods now every year with the American Heart products. So, oh, I got too far away maybe. Here we go. Uh, that was too fast. Here we go. Um, so a fundamental framework, and, and there are many frameworks out there. I don't care which one we take. As long as we can agree on one thing, that learning is not one dimension. It's not enough to have a lot of knowledge, but it's not enough either to have a lot of skills or to be extremely gritty or a kind person or an ethical person. Probably a large part of what we are as professional and most of the competency models you've seen are already been, uh, have been embracing this for a couple of decades, that it's multidimensional. So I just want to highlight that this is one multidimensional model to use. There is no truth to this, as long as we agree that there are multiple dimensions and that there is an often overlooked one, which is this one, the ability to learn more and reflect and adapt um, and be able to actually live with, with um, resistance, things that are hard, these kinds of things. Like, so there are some overarching things, metacognition, growth mindset, and that bucket of like wiffy waffy stuff that apparently are like, quite obviously the last years have turned out to be some of the most important predictors for your performance as professionals. So let's try to look into them a little bit further in each of them. So, and we'll deal with two of them first to get back to the, what, the one that is actually the elephant in the room. So let's take character and skills first. What is character? What does that mean? So that's all these, like again, a little bit, some people call them soft concepts like mindfulness, curiosity, courage, ethics, leadership. There are, there are a bunch of that category of stuff. I think soft skills is the wrong word. They're core skills. They're like durable skills. They're the kinds of stuff that actually penetrates everything else you're doing. And the number one predictor for future success is what? Pretty solidly proven scientifically the last 10, 15 years. What is the number one character, what is the number one skill or, or trait you need to have that predicts future success? Anybody knows? Perseverance? Curiosity? No, it's, it's in the right bucket, but it's not right. Close, but no cigar. It's four letters. Grit. And that's cheating a little bit because grit is the product of passion and perseverance. That's the, like the definition that grit for researchers have used for it. So passion and perseverance is more important predictor than anything else. Whether you look at cadets, at, uh, at officer training um, in the US, or you look, at, you look at pilots, if you look military, if you look academic performance, grit is the number one predictor no matter where they have looked. If you're gritty, you will succeed. So what's interesting about these things is that it's not necessarily intelligence. Actually, the top researcher in the world, um, has, and this has been on our advisory board, together with the top researcher in expertise. And they agreed really quickly that there is nothing like talent. I, I think that might be too radical. I think there are, and they, they also nuance it a little bit. Like if you're, if you're a 100 meter runner, there is probably something physical about talent. But talent is so little compared to grit and compared to a growth mindset and some of these other things. So these are way more important than we thought. There are also things in this bucket um, that has really surprising impact. The number one study in education, at least I've ever seen, the, the highest impact factor journal, is a nature publication, like not nature something, nature, 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 about by uh, David Yeager where he showed that by taking, he took just short of 2,000 um, high school students. 
I think 1,876 high school students, and he got them to teach younger students. Not necessarily exactly what they were later being tested in, just something. Their own grades went up, despite the fact that they were using time teaching younger students. It's pretty nuts. Another one, growth mindset, teach them 45 minutes of growth mindset. That's actually the David Yeager paper. Teach them 45 minutes of growth mindset theory, and their, and their performance goes up. Those, these two papers, the latter one is the nature paper. Um, taking simple things like this, classic character skills, and your academic performance measured exactly the same traditional boring way as we've always done it, and you can still see the impact. That's why Nature they took one paper and PNAS the other one. So they are way more important than we thought. So this is the queen of, of character. If anybody needs some bedtime reading, this is incredible. She narrated the, the audio book herself, and it's an amazing book because she's a scientist. It's not, it's not one of these books you pick up at an airport and think, who the hell wrote this? Um, another thing that is important, just to get some stakes in the ground here, is what do we actually know about what works for adult learners? Um, Ed Salas is one of the most fascinating researchers in human factors. And, and at some point, I suddenly found, oh, wow, 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 wow. That is way too fast. Come on. Here we go. He, he wrote a really nice overview of this. This paper is worth reading. And there's basically these six, th six things that are worth to think about when we are designing w the way we learn ourselves and the way we get other people to learn. Agency, the fact that you have influence on your own learning path is really important. Self-awareness and meta-learning, we think we've heard that before. In C2 remediation, what does that mean? Should we always debrief? Hey, anybody has tried to be debriefed? Have you used that word? After action review if you were in the military? This thing where you did something and then you meet afterwards to try to learn from it, right? Are there situations where you should wait, not, not intervene immediately? Probably yes, right? And if there are situations where you're trying to do complex problem solving, clinical decision making, should you intervene with the first step a resident makes wrong? Or are there learning objectives or learning goals that happens further down the track? You can hear the answer is yes. Of course, a part of what you need to learn is course correction when you do something that is not perfect. If you end up in what we as in human factors call fixation errors, one thing is to not end up there in the first place, but another thing is to learn how to recover from them when you're getting close to them. When, you're, when you realize, oops, I'm actually being trapped by a fixation error right now, I need to learn from that. And that means that the, the, the time where you're getting feedback on your performance is really critical and there is not a single truth. It depends. Dynamic modality, like that's the thing where like, it's probably not a good idea to learn everything from a book, trying to read everything. But on the other hand, the, well, the, the well-spread myth that there are auditory and visual learners, and like, I think most of us are probably biologists of some kind here. Anybody believe that kind of crap? But it was pretty well spread in, in the world of education for a while that they thought dynamic modality was, let's just show a lot of videos because they're visual learners. It's a little, way more complicated than that, but it has to have, you have to think about ways where you need to engage with it one way or the other. Zone of proximal development is pretty obvious, like don't, don't reach too far, but, but still push yourself, and reinforcement. Relatively, for, for us, uh, for me, this, is, this summarizes a lot of the research over the last few years. I won't spend too much more time on theory like this, because there are, there we go. Anybody heard about deliberate practice? <coughs> deliberate practice was a concept coined by Anders Ericsson. You've probably have heard about 10,000 hours to become an expert. That's also him. Now you will say, no, that's Malcolm Gladwell. No, it was Anders Ericsson quoted by Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell quoted him. Malcolm made a big mistake. He forgot to say that it was 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. Because you can do 10,000 hours of brain dead practice and get nowhere. So it's 10,000 hours of practice where you're actually trying to target your practice to close gaps in your performance. That's what you learn from. That's what you find that is happening. And when we met, when we met earlier um, we, with one of your colleagues, we, talked, we, we discussed this thing where you forget things. Like if you try things four or five times, then you leave it alone for a year, and then you come back to it. This reinforcement that was on its analysis list as well. This thing where, where, you, where you are able to constantly monitor where are my gaps, what am I not good at. This is yours truly. Anybody are divers in the room, scuba divers? 
Anybody do scuba diving of the kind where you know what I'm doing there? This is, so, so this one is a valve drill. This is when you do the beginning of technical diving. It's a very trivial skill in technical diving. You should be able to do it in your sleep. Since this picture was taken for, for a mock-up course, I had been doing another kind of technical diving since then, another kind of equipment. And recently, I was just stepping in to assist with another course. I screwed up this drill. I, I actually made a critical mistake. I was about to switch, like, critical thing, switch to a regulator with no air in it. I forgot to turn it on. Something I should be able to do in my sleep. I just hadn't done it for a year because I had moved on doing other kinds of equipment, that kind of stuff. Performance deterioration is real. If I can do this with something as trivial as this, and I'm a fairly sophisticated diver, a dive instructor, I teach people how to do this. I screwed it up. We can all screw this up. So and that brings us back to skills. How do we engineer skills? How do we maintain skills? And what is important here is that we have to be much more methodical about it. So this is another colossal screw up I've made recently. Like, this is one of the most, those of you who've tried to dive have most, most likely all tried this. You have to uh, blow up one of these safety sausages called an SMB and let it go to the air, let it go to the surface, uh, hold, held back by a string. You have no idea how much you can get entangled in one of these when all the stuff is happening at the same time. Because typically when you need one of these, something bad has happened already. I had been a dive instructor for 10 years, I think almost 10 years. When I, when I um, as somebody who were propelling to the surface, I actually had deco ahead of me, so I couldn't just follow that younger diver to the surface. And I, the, the diver swam into the line, and all sorts of stuff happened. And a few days later, a guy I dove with, who's today running the dive operation I financed later, because I wanted to study this more, he said, do you want to hear how we're doing it? Let, let me show you next time. And then I realized that these cave divers, that's how I actually got to know the cave divers, they are extremely methodical about something. We all thought that, oh, come on, it's just blowing air into it and let it go to the surface. Don't get too entangled. No, 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 no. This is like, these are exactly the fingers you're holding on the spool. This is exactly where you're doing this. Everything is done super methodical from day one. Because then the day you really need it, you can do it without thinking about it. Because this thing gets ingrained. And, and the same thing with the valve drill that I screwed up. I probably haven't done enough valve drills. I've primarily been diving rebreathers, which are not doubles like this. That's why my skills are not good enough with that yet. And I know now to go back and practice it. But you know what? Now, the same thing, I'm doing it just on the surface, just going through the valve drills all the time because I knew I had a weakness. That kind of very methodical working with skills are very, very important because what we're coming back to is in a second, we have a, we have a natural tendency to think that we're better than we are. We're, we are thinking about the times where we did it right, and we're celebrating those instead of pounding ourselves for the mistakes we're making. It's a very human thing that we'd like to feel good, right? We don't like to get out of the water. I, when I got out of the water after I screwed up the valve drill, the head of the center was like, what the hell is wrong with you? I said, I am steaming. I blew it up. Come on, I'm 50 years old. I've, I have thousands of dives. Like, there is absolutely no reason to react like this. But I was so embarrassed that I had ignored and I was overconfident and I can do it. And just before I jumped into the water, why didn't I go through it in my head? I was really, really disappointed with myself after that. But that is also the reason why the way I learn is, as one of the instructors I've, I've trained with a lot, he says, this is classic Navy SEALs way. They make all mistakes once, but they only make them once. I make more mistakes than my wife, but I only make them once. And, but I also progress faster in some ways. But I make all mistakes once because I get so pissed off, pardon my French, that it's much, much easier to focus on them later and close the gap. So where does that all fit together? Well, there is actually a lot of overlap now with where the biggest problem in medicine is, which is actually knowledge. And I know you may be disappointed with me now and being like, come on, did we come here to hear we should just do more knowledge like we've always done in medical school? But the reality is it's, it will still be 90, 95% of what medicine is in the future. Even with chat GPT or whatever they're called in the future, this will still be a very, very big part of being able to be healthcare professionals. It will actually be an even bigger part. 
So if anybody thinks that the amount, the need for learning stuff will go down, I will probably have to disappoint you. It will go up. If you just, if you just look at this from a historical perspective, how many more tools do we have for knowledge have we gotten since the first uh, re uh, industrial revolution in the 19th century? A ton, right? Not even just libraries, CD-ROMs, all the different things we've gotten where it got even easier to find knowledge. Have we had to learn more? Objectively, yes. The curriculum has exploded in the meantime. The stuff that is necessary to master has just gone one way. And this will only accelerate now. So we have to find ways where we can learn even more because we, I don't think we can make medical school or nursing school 12 years, 10 years, probably not productive, right? So how do we then do it? Because anybody, like, at least I didn't have any fellow students who were lazy when I went to medical school. The kids we've had staying with us in our home who went goes to medical school are not lazy either. My oldest daughter, the youngest daughter, is in pre-med. She's not lazy either. They cannot find 10, 20, 30 percent more time. And on top of that, all of what I just said about character development and skills development are not being focused on enough either. That needs to increase as well. So we need to do something better. Do we have any hope? And this is where we started 20 years ago, trying to figure out, can we actually can we find a way where we redistribute the resources we already have? That means that we have to refactor something we are doing dramatically to find those thousands of hours of time to learn. This study gave hope. Are you familiar with, anybody familiar with the study? I'm only doing this to keep you awake, a little bit of dynamic modality. So this study is from 1986, uh, made by Benjamin Bloom. He's most known for Bloom's taxonomy, but this study is probably even more important because what he showed was that one-on-one -on -one instruction, that's this one, so this is the impact of the performance on the group that got one-on-one -on -one instruction compared to class teaching. There was a two, um, a two sigma, two standard deviation improvement for the group that got one-on-one -on -one instruction. That's massive. That's the kind of stuff we're looking for. And that was why we started building these individualized uh, learning systems that could, mimic, that could mimic this kind of instruction. Because even if we couldn't get it perfect, what if we can get 95% of the way? All biologists and all, all scientists in the room will know two standard deviations. How much is that? In plain English, it's a hell of a lot. That's enough that if we can only get a standard deviation and a half, it's more than enough to solve this problem. And that's why we started building these systems. The interesting thing is it actually worked. Um, but it also worked for another reason, because one of the things we originally thought was that it was like there would be there would be fewer optimal ways to do this. And then we realized, wow, this is a way more complicated problem. People learn way more different than we thought. Todd Rose here, uh, many years later, wrote a book called The End of Average, another good bedtime reading book. And the interesting thing is these two are on average exactly the same. And this is just on really trivial parameters like, um, like physical uh, characters, characteristics. It was also funny that uh, when uh, the gynecologists in the US tried to uh, get the measures, they thought that the way to find out what the perfect American woman was, then they took all the standard measures of body measurements. Of course, it ended up with a completely ridiculous model of something. But, but the interesting thing is, how can we, do we have any examples from the brain, how, how we learn things? We actually do. This is a real study we made on getting, um, I think these were first year college students, to solve this mathematical problem. Very, actually a quite simple problem. You just have to end up with m equals zero. Everyone here, all pathways here represents a student or a path that one or more students took. So all edges in this graph represents students and only the students who eventually ended up getting it right. Coming back to the students out here, there is no doubt that the students out here are less efficient than the students who in five, six, seven steps got down here. These students out here seriously had to practice those, that skill of getting back on track because it was not efficient, but hey, they got there. They eventually got the right solution. And it shows us just with a simple math problem, if you can have like a few million different uh, combinations of ways to get to the correct answer on a simple math question, then we already know the order of magnitude of the problem we're dealing with, right? Ah, here we go. I think this is nonlinear as well. Um, so that led to this idea that we had to try to build nonlinear learning systems, systems that didn't treat everybody the same way. 
it can be okay for information purposes to do that. A little bit the way you have to treat today's uh, keynote. If you really want to learn something, don't ever do that. Move to something that is nonlinear, something that is optimized to how you learn. Um, we, this is the same thing that is called adaptive learning. Personalized learning is a broader term um, as often just used for context and explanation. You can compare these systems a little bit to the problem you had when you had to change map technology. So a traditional map, you had a fixed map, and the thing is that you basically try to figure out, you turn the map to try to see if you can make it fit the way the street was pointing. At least some people do that. Um, but what GPS has changed was what? They were able to measure where you were compared to the map. That changed everything, right? So do we have maps in education? Not the same way. We don't have maps on how things are necessarily related. But we do have the equivalent of maps, which is we actually often are able to agree on what are we trying to accomplish in terms of what should learning lead to? What should you be able to do by the end of training or learning? That map is good enough. But what we didn't have was a way to measure that in a very detailed way. And that's where we're coming back to some, one of the problems that has been extremely hard to solve in the past without massive investment. These are the kinds of projects we had thousands of authors working on because building those sensors that can tell us where we are, the GPS technology that can say, this is what Karsten has learned so far and this is the way he has learned it. We didn't have that. Nobody had like tens of thousands of questions. In, in Harrison's internal medicine, there's about 120,000 learning objectives. You need the two questions each. That's 240,000 questions you need to make or probes you need to make to just make a superficial check. It's only 120,000 important things that is in it. There's lots of other stuff, so you also need to filter out the stuff that is not important. So, so we, didn't, we couldn't afford that in the past. This is where the world changed about two years ago. We'll come back to that. So adaptive learning is this one that is able to help guide you on the way. And that's where the analogy stops. So from now on, don't even think about it. Just think about it as the explanation on you need something that can measure where you are compared to where you want to be. And the measurement instrument is critical. Why did, why did we actually not adopt GPS technology earlier? When did you guys get your first GPS? Probably about 20 some years ago, but not much more than that. What changed? Because in the late 90s, it was a piece of cake to do this. Why were they not commercially available? Why, could, why didn't they work? Because it was considered military grade technology. So the resolution of what you could be allowed to do as a consumer, there was, I think, about 100 meters. 100 meters, that's not enough to tell you where to make the turn. So it was absolutely useless because the resolution was not good enough. The second they downgraded this, the resolution on the military GPSs is still higher than the ones we have. But now we got it under the level where it in time can tell you when to make the right turn. It's the same in education. If you don't have enough granularity, we cannot tell you where to make the right turn. And that was the big breakthrough that we both made, but also the reason why some of you who have worked on it has been overwhelmed by the fact that it actually takes enormous efforts to build these sensor layers that are granular enough to make them worthwhile. All right, quick, and I think this is the last more academic approach, but I think it is worthwhile because there are theoretically three levels of adaptivity to think about that are worthwhile. The first one is curriculum adaptivity. What do we even learn? Do we have to adjust things over time? Medicine is one of the most extreme areas because of the amount of new papers that are being published and the way we need to change practice, clinical practice. So we actually need in, in healthcare to be way more aggressive in terms of curriculum adaptivity. And this is not a technical solution that is needed. This is a learning architecture. This is who actually helps guide what we're even prioritizing. So in some ways, we have an urgent need in all of education for a similar version of Cochrane, but in education, where we decide what is it that is most important? What is best practice? What does that look like? The second one is the one we've talked about so far. How do you actually learn something? How do you sequence learning for an individual learner? This is like the, the classic formula one of nonlinear adaptive systems that lies here. Next task adaptivity. How do you put the next step in front of a learner on the fly? And the bottom one is the, is back to the, in, uh, like you have to be in close correlation to when you remediate and what. The best example of this is when you, in the middle of, um, when you're in the middle of a math problem, makes a mistake. It's actually not productive. You can, be, you can be allowed to find the mistake yourself, 
but it's not too productive to make a long detour. Just tell people what it is and help them do it. We actually have one that is even more obvious in healthcare, which is if you do, a, who, has done, uh, a, who has done advanced cardiac life support, advanced life support? Probably a lot of you have, right? A lot of that is about complex clinical decision making. You don't want to stop the scenario in the middle of it. Allow people to make some mistakes and learn from them. But there is one skill that we proved while I was at Lerdl was absolutely vital to, to give feedback immediately on chest compressions. There is absolutely no need for doing 25 more in, inadequate chest compressions, whether they're too deep, too shallow, the wrong place. Stop it, just get it right, continue. That's why you will see this, the direct uh, consequence on the products was now you will have your cell phones with something that shows th the data from a resource and a mannequin immediately telling you, no, no, move your hands or push deeper, push, push faster, slower, whatever. Get that right because you don't learn anything from doing it wrong, which is different from the larger scenario where you actually learn from the larger pro uh, patterns, pattern problems and getting out of the depth, uh, the holes you've dug yourself into because that's an important skill as well. So intra-task adaptivity would be the equivalent of the CPR stuff where you give immediate feedback. Or this is the specific thing you made in this math problem. It's a little bit of a nerdy thing. So the big fat one is this one. But the other two, not to confuse them with. So nonlinear systems, they can adapt in real time. That's really, really important. They have to be able to do this in real time. Because we've had lots of adaptive systems. Probably your grandparents had adaptive systems when they took like a, where they mailed in their answers and two weeks later they got a new assignment back. Those mail-in courses have existed since the Second World War, since you had stamps almost, right? But that's not enough to make them really impactful and actually call them or get any impact out of the adaptivity. The second part is that they optimize and they, they work like this one-on-one -on -one tutor. And the third part is that they, um, they're able to adjust to the individual learner. So they're not following a pre-made plan. They are truly doing this. Have you seen any other kinds of intelligence that do not have a pre-made plan? GBT4. La large language models do exactly that. When they start writing the beginning of the sentence, they don't know what the end of the sentence will be. They don't have a plan for what comes out of the end of the sentence. It's a statistical model in popular terms that basically can say what the next word should be. Pretty nuts that it works, but it does. Adaptive systems work in many similar ways. We don't know what you're going to do five steps from now, but we do know what the next, we can optimize what the next next step is. What is the impact? The impact is quite interesting. So the dotted line here, that's the equivalent of a normal 45 minute course. Whether it's a classroom, 45 minutes, or it's 45 minutes in e-learning, they've shown to be roughly equivalent. In, the, in science. We can cut that initial time to proficiency down to about half. Median time, not average, medium. What is also interesting is that's despite allowing some, some learners to spend up to two hours, and the fast, but the fastest learners are only spending 12 minutes. So you actually have a span of from 12 minutes to 120 minutes. Have you ever seen an education system that can handle an order of magnitude difference between the slowest and the fastest learners. I've, I think I've studied everything that is interesting to look at. I've never seen one. It's impossible to handle unless you use technology of some kind because you can't find teachers that can handle that, that span. Right? So what we do instead normally is we say, you're too stupid, you may be too smart, you're super good, but you're getting bored. But these, we lose more like, probably more like less, all of these are being lost in the traditional system. Are you losing one third? When you, when you went to, a, when you last time w went on a two day course, did you look at each other at the end of it and being like, ha, one third of you have not gotten this. You're not proficient, right? Everybody left and felt that they were good. And we're coming back to another thing here. Here we go. Oops. Yep. So this is this concept that um, we began to get a hint of in the 90s when we studied human errors and simulators. And it, one of the crazy thing was that the hardest problem we were looking at, if you look at what is the biggest predictor for future success, that was four letter? Grid. grid. Yeah. The future predictor for future success was grid. What is the biggest predictor for not learning? 
unconscious incompetence. So the number one thing that can hold you back is if you think you're fine. If you think you're all good, a lot of errors, a lot of deadly errors are made in healthcare because of this. We all know them, right? It's somebody else. I did it with a valve drill. I was unconsciously incompetent. It's embarrassing to say it out loud. I hope you don't publish this. Because I should be able to do it. But unconscious incompetence is a big killer, both for patients but also for learning. Actually, much more for learning, because that's the thing that really inhibits learning moving forward. If you can just move them one step just into the yellow category to know what you don't know, that's enough. That's why training is important, and ongoing training, lifelong training is important. Because even if it's one thing you screw up and you realize, I should have been better, you are likely to look at everything else you're doing with a different set of glasses. So it is really important to shape that ability to know, to spot what you don't know and realize it, because that's the key to deliberate practice, which is the key to top performance. So how does that work? I, and is this pure theory? Absolutely not. We started three, almost 400,000 students, just over 380,000 college students. One semester, one subject. They got twice as fast and twice as accurate realizing what they don't, didn't know. That's a huge improvement. That thing alone could potentially explain the reduction to half in time to initial proficiency. The fact that they underway got better at knowing what they didn't know. That in itself is close to being able to explain the entire impact on that. And of course, the next step is you don't want to continue to be incompetent, but typically people are, are there for a relatively short amount of time. Because the second you realize that you do something about it typically. It's very easy to move people out of this. We've now studied this in all age groups, in all subjects, more or less, except hairdressers. Um, and, and the reality is you relatively quickly end up here. So what is this last category? Sometimes you'll see this presented as a two by two matrix, but the problem is that they call this one unconscious competence. And that's a little bit of a misnomer. It's, it's not a, I, I don't feel it's there. I don't think it's an appropriate way to describe it. Because if you ask people who are able to do it, they can explain what they are doing, but they don't have to use cognitive capacity to do it. So if you've ever driven a stick shift car, I think a lot here are old enough to probably learn to drive, that you learn to drive stick shift, right? You were probably competent at driving a stick shift car, changing gears, having a sip of coffee, yelling at your kids or your wife or your husband, and reflecting on what's on the radio station at the same time as you were shifting gears. It's totally automated. And you actually, after you did it, you probably have no idea which gear you were in when you were outside that big building because it, it was an automation. If you multiply six by seven, most of you can get the right number without any significant amount of cognitive workload. Two by two, almost everybody can, right? So, but what, why not get everything here? It takes too long. You cannot get everything done, it's not necessary. A lot of it is not enough to be here. So a surgeon tying knots, that's a pretty good idea that you have that on automation. Um, if, um, do, but, if, but there are other things where if you do a procedure like three times a year, it's okay that you have to think about it. It's okay that you have to be careful, you have to be very cognizant about what you're doing. This is, this is one of the biggest, uh, and this concept of, the, uh, of this uh, model of this, it's one of the biggest changes that you can probably make to your, your skills engineering and in your entire learning engineering, including knowledge, that you can think of. Here we go. This is also interesting. If you then look at these data from uh, the pediatrics program from uh, NEGM, where uh, you should think that physician, any, pedi any pediatri pediatricians in the room? Okay, then I can't make too much fun of you. Um, but, but these are pediatricians that uh, are studying for their board exam, recertification board exam. So they should be pretty good. You, the two of you, I think we're roughly the same age, so you probably have like 30 years, 40 years of school behind you. The same with these people here. This one here, this distribution here, is how unconsciously incompetent they were. That's actually pretty scary. Like you had, pre like this is 30% of their answers here where they were unconsciously incompetent. Would you send your kids to somebody who was 30% unconsciously incompetent? But they were. 
This is a pretty large study. This is 3,706 3, pediatricians. Studying for the board exam using a method where you're consciously working on this, you see we made a reduction of over one third, we, and we moved the dangerous tail end here. So even with somebody who are professional learners, like of course pediatricians who've gotten through all this are already stellar learners. You almost don't find better learners than this. It is actually a huge improvement in performance, and it's something where there's all reasons to believe that it's not just related to the domain. This one is completely nuts. So here you have an extreme example where um, a defense force took their flight school for F-16 pilots. And to graduate flight school, you have to be near perfect, which means how the heck can you improve that? Then somebody said, that's not the problem. The problem is retention. Let's measure them 10 weeks later and look at the difference in retention. Huge difference between the intervention group and the control group that got traditional classroom training. They performed exactly the same 10 weeks earlier. This is the, the key of the knowledge depending on how you learn it. So what does all this mean? I think the most important things to take away from this is that skills engineering and knowledge engineering in the future has never been more important. It was not possible to do the project at even larger scale than you've been doing in the past. And the undertaking that, that uh, St. Gallen in, embarked on about three years ago? Three years. three years ago. Was kind of nuts. When I heard about the program the first time, it's was like, they will break their necks. But, but you were more persistent and more gritty. So it actually did work out. In order to scale it from now on, it will be necessary to deploy new technologies because you've also seen that this is a humongous effort. Like, there are no other hospitals in the world doing this. So don't, but please don't use this to say you shouldn't be doing it. Like, that would be the wrong way to, that would be the wrong conclusion because it is the future. But you are well ahead of the curve. But the thing that has changed is that it's possible to scale it now. Um, and if we then go back and have a look at where our, our technology here has been building the hemochromatosis study. As our program, it might actually be done. Oh, it didn't be do much, right? Oops, it did. So it has built all this uh, introduction, these uh, different parts here. It has built a whole bunch of ebooks related to this. And actually, it picked the right mutations. My wife made her dissertation about these. So and for all of this, it has built, um, it has extracted learning objectives. So in total, it has made, um, we can see that out here if we do this, it has made uh, 56 learning objectives, 78 multiple choice questions, 11 ebooks, uh, 52 slideshows to explain it, um, 10 fill in the blanks. And for all fill in the blanks, I'm sorry, for all questions, even the distractors have explanations. They're, they're typically relevant. I've not checked any of them. You can see here the, the different genes that it's suggesting here. I don't know whether there are any geneticists in the room. But at the first sight, it's actually correct what it's writing about the other competing genes that are not the correct answer. When I did this the first time, my wife is making the biggest program in the world about this in clinical chemistry. And the first one, she had like minor changes to it. When I do this with the cave divers, they have only minor changes to it. What that leaves us with an opportunity to do is, now we can focus all the rest of the efforts on the really hard things, the skills, the character development. How do we actually build learning environments where people become better learners so that they can learn new things? Because all this stuff that we couldn't afford to do in the past is now suddenly possible. So that yes, there will not be the same need for human learning engineers as there are in the future. But that does, it's not a problem because we still need people who are architect architecting and orchestrating learning. But we need to shift them from doing the mechanical process of reading the text, translating it back to learning objectives, writing the probe layer or the test, testing layer, the assessment layer that is necessary for nonlinear systems to work, explaining why the distractors are not correct so you can do the bottom layer of adaptivity and micro-remediation, all that stuff can now be done with this because you basically just ask this, um, this nerd technology, just write me this. 
The thing is, it's not that simple because there's a lot of methodology behind it. That's why you need an educational, education, uh, educational expert technology, something that understands education and knows how to write a good multiple choice question, how to select good distractors, how to uh, uh, um, eliminate the ones that are not good enough, what should go into uh, an ebook. And as an example, if, you, if we go back here and have a look at one of the ebooks, what you will see is it incorporates everything we know about learning science and how to write good texts. I'm not saying text is the best solution for everything, but a lot of people actually, the fastest way for them to get a first pass or something, and probably for a lot of you, is still to get text. But it's even better if somebody has highlighted it so you can use skimming, technology, uh, skimming techniques. All slideshows are made with all the things and all the um, expertise that we usually taught learning engineers. We've taught I don't know, 10, 15,000 learning engineers certified them over the years. All the things that went into these curriculum, uh, the curricula, we've now put into a technology where we use uh, large language models to crunch it. What comes out of it is the stuff that, that you often came back and said, oh, this is a lot of work to get to this. But the, the new thing is we can actually get to something that even in medicine, even in things that are relatively recent, is good enough and we, don't, we only have to tweak it. Push one button more, and then you can actually turn this live to learners. We always recommend that you do a review of everything, but to be honest, we're north of 95% of stuff that is just being used as it is, even in areas like specialist medicine. So that's where, that's where AI suddenly changes a lot of things. Another big area for it is, I probably heard a lot about skills. Like, we have to figure out which skills do we need in the future. Um, there are, uh, companies, any of you use LinkedIn? I, you need some exercise. Who uses LinkedIn? I use LinkedIn. Okay, a lot of you use LinkedIn. I know it sounds silly, but science actually shows but just moving your arm keeps you more awake. Um, so, so when you use LinkedIn, or the fact that you just stop and reflect for a second because I said something silly. Um, LinkedIn uses a technology called burning glass. How did burning glass figure out what skills are important? They scanned job ads. So they basically took job advertisements all over the world and then they scanned them and then they took the keywords and they said a keyword that was associated with a job description or job title, they were probably important. That's not the case. Um, how many of you, uh, how many surgeons? Surgeons, anybody show that hand? Yeah, there are lots of surgeons, yeah, I know. So has, it ever, has, has the job ad or the posting of a job ever talked about compassion? talking to patients, we take it as a granted thing. That's a, that's a fundamental flaw in scanning job ads for keywords to figure out what skills are. If you ask large language models like GPT-4, it actually comes up with something really, really accurate. It will have all the things that when we in the past have analyzed these other approaches to skills mapping that they have flawed. Even GPT-3.5 was good enough at uh, speeding these other technologies up. So that begins to open up the answers are beginning to give us the answers to the scale problem we have with the knowledge engineering. This is deliberate practice in a nutshell. My daughter taking weird kind of blurred photos. Sorry about that. Um, in the North Pole. So the, the um, I think that I, I will end with this, which is a huge, encouragement to keep going, to keep doing what you're doing. Um, I think in terms of these technologies, usually the, the, the mantra should be that you're going to overestimate what it's going to do short term and you're going to underestimate what it's going to do long term. In this case, you're going to underestimate both. It is absolutely out of this world when you work with, not, particularly with knowledge, what these technologies will be able to do and given that you're not in publishing, you should not be worried. This is a gift, it's not a threat. I'll end here.